Hey everyone, welcome to You'll Probably Agree, and it's another year, it's another Best Picture winner, and uh, join me with that is uh, Tarek Fayumi from Movies of Tarek, and my old co-host, uh, Leo Brady from a movieguy.com. How's it going? Awesome, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us, Mike. Yeah. Of course. So, it's a crowded year with Best Picture winners. We got about like 10 of them. Yeah. So, a, a full slate. Yeah. Uh -huh. All... You know, the last, I think, two years in a row, it's only been, they've only had nine. Yeah. And now they've officially hit the full ten, which I think, I'm guessing, the Academy is probably really happy about. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. The, the, the competition is truly on when it comes, like, especially be Best Picture. I mean, Oppenheimer, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Past Lives, and many more to name. I feel like it's almost like... Like, it's hard to keep track, but at the same time, I really like that competition, especially after the summer where people had their Barbenheimer weekend, watching Barbie and Oppenheimer together. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. speaking with that, I think we'll just go straight into the uh, first movie, which was Oppenheimer, and this seems to be like the movie that's going to win yeah. the yes. Oscar this year. It's Christopher Nolan's year. <laughs> So every Christopher Nolan fan, including myself, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. is going to yep. go be celebrating. Yes, <laughs> as, as, as me as well. I I think this was the year of Oppenheimer. I think yeah. um, it's it's kind of exciting to see a kind of a little bit of an old school movie being the front runner, but also yeah. uh, you know a director who puts so much time and craft into the films that he makes finally getting the attention it and typically deserves yeah absolutely and, and also like it's it's like a film where oppenheimer just makes your mind think in many different directions like in terms of conflict writing the steps to making something happen and there's always like that emotional element that christopher nolan uh is able to mend with his audience and with that alone he even it knows how to have the technology with like now i mean look it's still in cinemas some of which are still in a 70 millimeter projection i honestly believe there's no true way to watch Oppenheimer unless you see it like on in in film. Yeah, right, honestly. in film. On, on digital. It's funny they they shot this movie so much on IMAX, and they keep talking about oh it's this big epic movie, and I'm like, well a lot of the film just takes place in this little room yeah, that yes. Oppenheimer's getting basically interrogated in so they can take away security clearance. Right. It didn't feel it felt more like a small budget movie yeah. than it did like a big <laughs> epic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think he he kind of found a way to make a movie that is big in budget, big in cast, all of those things, yeah. and yet what it's best at is sort of the things that Old school films, whether it's Twelve Angry Men yeah. or you know old Sidney Lumet movies or Capra films that are able to sort of just focus in on the characters, it's that stuff that really is is the best part of Oppenheimer. It, it, at least in my opinion, I mean, I think it really does focus in on Oppenheimer himself and yeah. make it about his internal struggle. You know, dealing with as you said, being interrogated the choices that he's made that have affected him, um, the repercussions that it's had in terms of yeah. what the United States of America had done during war. Um, it's it's impressive. It's a very impressive film. And, and, and yeah, and I think it's by far the, the most scaled down Christopher Nolan movie yeah. of his last, <laughs> you know, 10, 10 films that he's made. I mean, from Tenet to the Batman movies to uh, Inception, this is really one of the, his more simpler films. Yeah, yeah, yeah because it, it's mostly takes place in like a bunch of classrooms, and Los Alamos isn't like this huge epic place. It's just like a little desert yeah. that everyone's constructing the bomb in. But it, it's, it's a movie where uh, it has its flaws, um, kind of like most Christopher Nolan movies. It's over-calculating and... You know, it's kind of light in emotion. Like, the biggest uh, conflict of the film is that Oppenheimer's going to lose his security clearance. Right. And, like, that's not a lot to go on. But what makes the movie work so much is its pacing, is its editing, yeah. is its uh, usage of the montage. It's, it's basically like when they had the can you hear the music scene, I'm like... 
you know, not, not to sound cliche, but they're like, this is cinema. <laughs> yeah. When I was watching this. Yeah. And that that's the feeling you have. Like, anyone could have made a movie about Oppenheimer where he felt really bad about making the bomb. And then, you know, he smokes himself to death. And then right. that's it. Um, right. But this is a much more complicated movie. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mike. It's a film that really gets you in the mode to kind of just think where it makes where it made me think what's on this person's mind right now wh- wh- which affiliated party is 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 on Oppenheimer's side and not how is Oppenheimer like 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 going through these processes why are wh- why is there defense with him why is there not defense like there's so many moving parts all of which it's like it's like Oppenheimer's character is going over but at the same time he's still hitting plateaus and he still navigates through it that's why I love about how Nolan can direct. He knows how to find a conflict and improve in in Murphy's performance that that Murphy is Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer is someone who will stop at nothing to 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 accomplish his mission of creating this atomic bomb. Yeah. 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 I just I just wish there was more than just like, oh, we're going to take away your security clearance. Like we yes. could have seen some of the repercussions of that. Like we could have seen him lose his home. We could have seen him like lose a lot of respectability but for sure you know, yeah for sure yeah i mean i think it i think it definitely delves into sort of like how the his obsession and his choices that he's made has impacted obviously the women that have been in his lives yeah even though yes. even though those women are probably very thinly written as most nolan films tend to be yeah uh but yeah and i think i think um it, it does this sort of fascinating thing by not just focusing on him but yet still showing a, it, there it really is for lack of a better term a chain reaction uh, uh, you know how his yeah. choices <laughs> and the things that he's doing in his obsession is impacting everybody around him uh not just on a global scale but also on a minute scale of you know the, the women that are in his lives or the people that he has relationships with um yeah and i think i think the movie definitely maybe could find out a little bit more conflict outside of just the room of his clearance being stolen but i think it, it kind of picks that up with strauss with the strauss character and allows it also to be about him there, there's really a lot of moving parts and a lot of complexities here that i think that's maybe the juggling act that mm-hmm. nolan had to sort of figure out well that's that's Christopher nolan for you he doesn't make movies he makes puzzles and, yeah, yeah and when you're watching one of these like you're you're going to each little part to see how each little thing fits in because Oppenheimer, you can't just see it the first time and be like, oh, I got everything. I right. understood. <laughs> like, no, you, you got to see it a few times to understand because I'll be honest, first time I saw it, I was like, wait, what was that about? Who did, who, but then when I saw it a second time, and granted, I also read the screenplay, yeah, it helped, it helped uh, develop it a little more, especially with the screen, but the screenplay is interesting because it's taken through the first person perspective, right? It doesn't say Robert enters the room, it says I entered the room, for oh, instance. Interesting, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, it's, it's through his head a lot, yeah, and, and like how you said, like, like how we were saying. Moving puzzles, like I almost think, think about a Christopher Nolan film like Inception, where that's moving parts, but then it's like you have to watch it so many times to understand the moving parts. I feel the moving parts in Oppenheimer are easier to understand because it's like conflict A, conflict B, com- con- conflict C, then conflict, all of which has a much easier understanding. Sometimes not 100% understand, but this is like one where, where you're just like, well, the pieces will come together regardless of the outcome. It's probably going to be pretty or not be the outcome we expect. And that's where there's like a revolution with it because... And like even looking back at Christopher Nolan's previous work, I feel like this is a film where where he kind of questions where he wants his audience's mind yeah. to be pushed to the max of yeah, how yeah. much they can take. Totally. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, right. For sure. Well, yeah. That's, that's that's what he's good at. He's good at challenging you and not just <laughs> giving you a simple film you're going to see once right. and then understand it completely. Yeah. And I think and I think like the Academy voting body is relatively educated enough to understand the process and everything that it, what that went into it for Nolan to make the film and I, and that's why I think it's definitely the front runner. I mean, I think there is a genuine appreciation from the voters, there's a genuine appreciation from everybody involved about what it took to get this movie made. Yeah. How many, you know, and usually for a lot of times with the Oscars it's who was employed and who, you know, who was yeah. brought in. And, yes. and a lot of Hollywood worked on this movie. There's a lot of people, you know, that uh, appreciate and respect 
Nolan and everything that he does and everybody on the film, honestly, Killian Murphy and, and Emily Blunt, all of those people are very well renowned in the in the industry. Uh, and I think that makes it a pretty solid front runner, you know, yeah. right off the bat. Yeah, because you have a large cast, but everyone kind of has their moment to shine. Totally. You have Rami Malek, who's in the uh, who, who's being who basically exposes Strauss for what he's doing. Yeah. You know, you have Robert Downey Jr., who kind of plays this petulant um, senator who. Or was he a senator? Or no, he was the head of the Atomic uh, Energy Commission. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and he was, and he was uh, going for a cabinet seat. Correct. And yeah, the, the movie kind of made me feel like I want to invest more in Strauss and totally. Oppenheimer oh, yeah. sometimes. Yep. But the, the 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 dynamic between the two were the where, where you know basically Strauss is the everyman, right? In a way. Right. And and you know Oppenheimer is the genius. He reminds me of that line in uh, JFK when not JFK in Nixon. Yeah. When Richard Nixon's looking at a portrait of JFK and he says, "When people look at you, they see what they want to be. When they look at me, they see what they are." Yeah. And th yeah. that's sort of what Louis Strauss's whole thing was about. He's the lowly shoe salesman. Right. He's the guy <laughs> that. Not everyone wants to get to know and they don't like. Right. And he's jealous of Oppenheimer because he's this charismatic, charismatic personality. Sure. That, uh, you know, builds this bomb and makes a fool of him, I think, at the, at the Atomic Energy Commission when it came to the transportation of isotopes. Right. Which I don't think everyone's going to get the first time they see that. They're going to be like, why is he mad at him? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it shows, too, sort of the... Um, bitterness that people can hold back and, you know, or, or um, having not a feud, but it, but it really is sort of him holding a lot of regrets back and, and wanting to sort of take it out on Oppenheimer in a lot of ways. Yeah. But, but as you said, too, it, it kind of, you know, referencing Oliver Stone films like Nixon or JFK, yeah. you know, this is one of those movies that's about, like, the drips and drabs about all the characters surrounding Oppenheimer. Yeah. You're not going to get the full details on exactly who they were or what they were doing. But the more that those those pieces all line up together, yeah. you start to see the life of a, of the singular man. Huh. You know, you start to see the life of Oppenheimer for itself. And I think that goes to show, again, in the writing, how how good it is because, like, Downey Jr. is, like, the front runner for Best Supporting Actor. Yeah. But really, there's, like, seven supporting actors in this movie that all deserve tons of credit, mm -hmm. whether it's Josh Harnett, Downey Jr., um, Emily Blunt, yeah. Florence Pugh. I mean, they all are really get Oh, Matt Damon. I think yeah. Matt Damon's honestly oh, yes. kind mm -hmm. of gotten forgotten about in this movie, yeah. and he he's so um, good. So I and, think like that's sort of and, the part that uh, people Alden don't Aldrich has like a great oh, yeah. role in it, especially like he has that ending line where you know they say, "Well, you were talking about Einstein the whole time. You think you're talking." trash about us but right maybe they're talking about something more important right. you ever think about that lewis <laughs> yeah. and, you know, there's that scene and then there's emily blunt scene where she like turns everything around in the interrogation room yep. or or, or, in, or in the court whatever you want to call it yep you know and the, the funniest thing is like everyone has a shining moment except for oppenheimer in the yeah. film. he <laughs> seems kind of just a little too dry and drab <laughs> sure. throughout the whole film yeah he just kind of has like one line delivery where he's always just very and, right concentrated and and, talking like this. and and <laughs> even when we're talking about like moving parts i remember before before our oppenheimer screening i remember what i found myself having to knowing going in that this was going to be a political film i wrote down the actors who they're playing but also i would write down what their role is in yeah, the film yeah. because and then that gave me a little glimpse of how to go back and put together how there was conflict in this historic time frame how is that going to win because when i wa watched this film like then it was starting to, it started to come to make more sense to me especially when they gotten the moments of investigation more also when it came you know to oppenheimer and his relationships or sure. the, or the political vibes or who he's rooting for, but also just there's always that one thing where it's almost like it's like a level of seniority and who and, and who's connected is kind of where where Oppenheimer starts to find its way of coming together. But on, but I think in a way it kind of shows that the seniority route of of Oppenheimer and all the seriousness, the seniority of it 
of everyone associated is kind of where sometimes the aftermaths of 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 unexpected errors come around yep. but I, at the same time though the unexpected errors only make Oppenheimer a more invigorating experience right yeah right. yeah I think we're all in agreement is it's going to be I think I it agree. does it deserve to win best picture I think it does yeah. I mean there's some competition I feel but I do believe even if it's a little off topic I know we're focusing on best picture but I think it's only competition is a little more in the best actor realm because of how Paul Giamatti is also nominated has been winning in some categories between yeah. him and Killian Murphy I do believe that's the only very big like like challenge for it as best actor. Yeah, I mean, unless you know, <laughs> you know, I know we'll go through some of these other movies, but I mean, unless sort of the, there is this sort of big upset from a movie like Past Lives, or as we excuse me, as we talked about a little bit off air about the international films, maybe getting yeah. a little bit more attention. I think those are sort of it's made it's major competition. Yeah. Uh, oddly enough, I think. Oppenheimer kind of neutralizes Killers of the Flower Moon because yeah. it's because from the Academy view, voters' viewpoint, they're they're probably very similar in terms of what movie yes. should be hey. getting the attention. And and, and as of and, right now, Oppenheimer and, is the front runner. And, so. and and look, Oppenheimer is still in theaters. I mean, Killers is too for a warty, but Oppenheimer has been still just earning attention much yeah. much more than yeah, Killers. Yeah. They've already outdone its uh, its growth right. so I much. Mean, exactly, <laughs> Oppenheimer hit that billion dollar mark, and and that speaks to it um still yeah. sells out often yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. well it's it's a three-hour biopic you yeah. know if you want to call it that i know yeah. Chris, christopher nolan hates categories right but right uh th- this one's like a three-hour biopic as is killers of the flower moon but this one you get so much more from it where killers of the flower moon kind of felt like repetitive and we're like okay sure. yeah. ernest is letting someone else die again he's an yeah. asshole we yeah, get it yeah <laughs> totally i mean and and repetition tends to be a scorsese sort of yeah. you know uh a mark you know he, yeah. he all of his movies whether it's taxi driver the departed they all kind of have these moments of repetition um you know he's kind of like a poet in that way or yeah. you know a songwriter yes. he likes the re- repetitiveness to sort of hammer in the message to his audience uh that doesn't always yeah. work for for the viewers and and oppenheimer certainly has its arc it goes from a beginning middle end had yeah. you know easier for audiences to digest easier for the voting body to, to digest and yeah i think that's why it makes it the front runner instantly yeah and then challenging it directly we got barbie yeah oh boy is, oh boy yeah i i mean honestly i mean barbie is is fun but i really i really doubt that's gonna take best yeah. picture i mean it's i mean it's fun for what it is but i don't think and yes it's good many, good in many aspects but i do not think that speaks enough sadly to make the front runner on best picture yeah it does so, not, yeah sadly. i think i think barbie you know it, it's a great story it's a great yeah. sort of great story in the movie but also a great story for the academy to sort of have a conversation about you mm-hmm. know to be like hey look at this great you know it's a feminist film. It's a movie that sort of speaks for women, speaks for, you know, it's a great comedy. Honestly, it doesn't get enough attention as a comedy. I it think does it's not. Absolutely hilarious. Um, but it also is not your typical best picture winner. No. You know, they, the Academy has sort of uh, created a precedent with everything everywhere all at once winning. You know, that means that not the typical Oscar winner <laughs> is going to be the best picture. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think it has really good chances, it, but I think, you know, it, it really is going to depend on how much people stray away from Oppenheimer, really. Right. I, well, I, it's I a agree. toy advertisement at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, is, it is a toy advertisement because the way you look at it, it's like all it's like these toys we've seen commercials of. Now they have its own world. But I will I do give Greta Gerwig a ton of credit. She knows how to, like, create the world out of Barbie and, like, kind of the right context very well totally she really does yeah yeah i i do give her credit but i don't think barbie will speak enough to win in best picture category well the the problem is is because it is a toy advertisement like yeah Mm -hmm. it's 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 one because you couldn't have found a better way to make a barbie movie 
You know, you, you made a movie about a stereotypical doll <laughs> right. that represents like the worst in women, you know, because they all want to be like this perfect model doll right. and they can't be. But then you learn through the movie, well, Barbie's not just this one doll. You know, yeah. you have your plus size Barbie. You have your presidential election Barbie. Right. You know, you have all you have your space uh, Barbie. Yep. But and that that's all great because that that shows like, yeah, women can actually grow and become their own person and they can represent all these things that Barbie represents. Right. That's great. But it doesn't. But it's not like enough where I'm like, oh, this is best picture. Right. You know, because it's it's a it is a feminist statement. Yep. Which works because it's not like beating you over the head with. Well, it kind of is beating you over the head with it. But. It works, yeah. You know, because yeah. you have American Ferrer's character's daughter, who's basically telling Barbie off, saying, "You represent everything that we hate," you know. Yeah. And and there's that great monologue from her, uh, but the uh, you know, but the movie doesn't really soar out, outside of that. Like it's a great comedy. I think that the attention it's gotten through the award season, through the box office, is really telling. It shows how we can actually have more female filmmakers who are profitable. Yeah, because totally. we couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. Because we we've, we've had so many film female filmmakers whose movies have gotten forgotten, stuff like that. Right. I mean, like Past Lives in a way is going to get forgotten this year at this year's Oscars. Yeah, which is a I love Past Lives. Yeah. Good film. I mean, I, I do think um, I do think Barbie. You know, in so many ways. Everybody's really shocked about Gerwig getting snubbed for best director, and I think yeah. the reason behind all of that, her, you know, her snubbing is so ridiculous, is because I think the needle that she had to thread with this movie was so that you know the, it was so thin. It was really not an easy accomplishment to make. To, like yeah. as you said, it is like sort of a glorified toy commercial turned into a movie. But also, you know, she she found a way to split all these hairs to make a movie that is profitable, can can speak to, you know, uh, men and women of all ages, yeah. can be a comedy, can be a feminist story, can be, uh, you know, <laughs> this original piece that nobody had ever seen before, nobody had ever seen it done. And yes, still a commercial product all at the same time. I mean, yeah. I really think her... Her snubbing is really the only controversy out of the Oscar nominations, and for a lot of reasons. I think yeah. like it was so complicated to get this movie right. Yeah. I go back to, you know, I listened to her get interviewed, uh, Greta Gerwig get interviewed yeah. about it, and she talked about how... Gosling had asked her, like, how do I play this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know who Ken is. I don't know what to do with Ken. Yeah. And I think that's pretty universal for the entire movie. It's like, how do you turn a toy doll into an actual drama, into an actual message, into an actual funny movie? Yeah. And she accomplished that. I mean, I think I think the nomination for Best Picture speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, I would be more than happy if Barbie was the winner for Best Picture. I'd be mm. shocked. That's for yeah. sure. But, um... But yeah, I think it's definitely deserving. It's one of the most deserving and, best pictures and, I've seen in a while. And I will say also, like even with that, it's like finally, you know, of course, of course, in our younger days and even till now, we love animations. Like I love Toy Story, and looking at something like Barbie, I'm thinking the world of toys, which not many people are buying toys, but many still do for yeah. nostalgia. I'm mm -hmm. thinking the toy world has finally found a way in the finding it's writing to be cinematic for its more grown up audience who yeah. don't play with toys. I and mean, that's what I feel totally. Barbie is. Truly. Yeah. And I, I'm totally with you on that. I think <laughs> the thing that I'm hoping what doesn't happen, which I, it probably <laughs> will happen is that Hollywood will get the wrong message and we'll just start making more movies exactly like this yeah. as opposed to just giving more women freedom and opportunity to make the movies that they want. Oh you know? yes, for sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's a chance that happening. Let's hope it doesn't, but yeah. we don't yeah. know. <laughs> Right, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I would be okay with the winning best picture, but yeah, it would be a shock. I, yeah. I don't think that it is necessarily the best picture of the year. Right. You know, I, I think there are stronger movies out there, but it's one of the best comedies that we've seen in years. Yep. And it's also, you know, it, it's not, it, it's not flat. I think Greta Gerwig couldn't have been a better choice. Right. To, to do this movie yeah. because under the helms of most other directors it could have just been this for 
forgettable film. Right. And she's also yeah. and also she's married to a pretty talented director as well, uh, Noah Baumbach. Yeah, so he's the who, who helped yeah. Uh, yeah. write the film. Yeah, yeah, so I feel a lot of her creativity also like 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 helped with that with this film as well. Totally. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Well, Commercial art is still art. Yes. You know. Well, and and it, uh, yeah, and I, it, that's a... <laughs> exactly. I think that's sort of the fighting problem that people have, right? Where an a independent filmmaker like Gerwig is sort of vaulted into very commercial filmmaking. Um, she is, you know, somebody that most independent filmmakers don't want to see her make yeah. this type of movie and make that type of movie. But she really did find a way to have her cake and eat it too, to sort of make a film that speaks to those independent film sentiments, but yeah. is also the highest grossing movie oh. of 2023. You know, it's, it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, I don't think you can ignore the success that Barbie's had. Yeah. I think they're going to have a sequel Yeah, and it's, Probably not going to be as good. Right. I think. I think. Yes. I think one film was good enough. I don't know. I would like to see Killian Murphy make an appearance in Barbie. Too. <laughs> oh, I would too. I could yeah. picture that. It would be almost a scenario. It's like remember our movies competed. Well, I've decided to take a break from that franchise and join the Barbie <laughs> franchise. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He's never going to leave Christopher Nolan. Those two have been together for years. Oh, they have. Yeah. yeah. Especially if the Dark Knight films and then then Inception and then this and they just go way back. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But then uh, just going down here, we'll go to some of the uh, foreign language nominees, or one of them, Anatomy of a Fall. Yeah. Now, this movie, uh, the first time I saw it, I was just okay with it. The second time I saw it, I was like, damn, this is a really good movie. Yeah. Because it makes you question everything that's happened. It makes <laughs> right. you question reality. It makes you question morality. It makes you question what happened. You know, because and and the funny thing is, at the end of the day, it doesn't give you any clear answers. Right. You don't know if Sandra Huller pushed her husband out the window or not. Right. You know, we can only just speculate. Yeah. I, I speculate that it was just a freak accident and he fell. Yeah. But I could see why, he, you know, she could have also done it or why he killed himself. But, right. You know, it's a movie where you see it and you keep thinking about the details of the case and it doesn't feel like some stupid true crime thing. Yeah. And, you know, it, it actually feels like a movie about real characters going through a real situation who don't know how to adjust to it. You know, you, you have the mother who, or, you know, you have Sandra Hullock, Huller, Hullock? Uh, Sandra Huller, <laughs> who, uh, you know, she basically is thrust into this murder mystery. We don't know if she actually killed this guy or not. You know, we have her blind son who basically has to like go in front of court and confess right which that, that was one of the funny they made him confess twice yeah one time it was in front of the whole court the second time he confessed there was like no one there I'm not sure how that worked out yeah um, but and I will say like even looking because I'm kind of now thinking back to anatomy of a fall the one thing I think about is like and I even remember writing this when I reviewed it where I wrote the auto the autopsy of confusing factors and the tough love exhibited at anatomy of a fall betray a very emotional form of resilience each piece of evidence is a new piece of the puzzle ultimately how did the death of Samuel happen that that's the ultimate question of this film with all these moving parts of sure. like tension and just and confusion and even for even for a blind kid not right. knowing he's, he's like I can't see my surroundings I don't know what happened it's yeah. just like and also did she having to go to court to do all this that just kind of shows how it's a world where it's like things want to go by the rules and regardless of what they're saying they still want to investigate and that's yeah. where that's where that film is stressful it's like it's a reality of acceptance that no one wants to accept but somehow they have to mentally learn to accept it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, too, it's it, it really is a interesting film about sort of everything on trial, whether it's, you know, uh, she's on trial, the son's on trial, <laughs> oh, like yeah. like what is the the truth is on trial. The the concept of doubt is on yeah. trial. Yeah. Um, and I think like I think the only the only small problems that i have with anatomy of fall is honestly it's just long it's a very long yes. arduous film um but it really does make you question basically everything mm -hmm. uh, as mike said um it has arguably 
one of the best, if not the best, performance of the year by Sandra Huller. I yeah. mean, she has to compose herself. She has to transition from being mother to maybe she's a sociopath. Maybe <laughs> she is. Maybe she. When she has that fight with her husband. And yeah. Like, oh. Monologues, yeah. long standing monologues. Everybody really is delivering long monologues too. The son, the, um, the defense the guy, attorney. Yeah. yeah. You know. So I think. Um, the direction from Justine Trier is, you know, it's it's amazing. You know, there's reason why she's nominated for Best Director. Yeah. And um, I think it's, you know, as you said, I think upon first watch, you're really about like, okay, that was a lot to process. Yeah, you that, know? that was a lot for me to take in. I'm like, wait, what happened with this case? But the, the yeah. second time I saw it, I'm like, holy yeah. shit, that kid gave his... Uh, Dog oh, Advil, yeah, just to see if the yes. dad committed suicide or not. Right. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. The, all the, all these little details come together, and it's a film about the small details. Yeah, that's what it you is. Know? And and yeah, one. <laughs> woo, yeah, it's a, it's a it, it's a head case. I yeah, mean, it's very intense. It's very it's a lot to consume. Yeah, I do think that sort of, uh, you know, again. People will complain about Oppenheimer or Killers of Flower Moon being long, but but An Enemy of Fall is a very long sit, and it's a lot of details to take in, yeah, a lot of information to take in, and and at the end of the day, you really are a lot. It, it, it's the type of movie that you definitely have to go see with friends so that you can go out to dinner after and have a long conversation about yeah. it. Oh, oh, what did you I think? Agree. What did you <laughs> yeah. think? Was she you know? guilty or not? Yeah, yeah, was she guilty or not? I mean, I think mm -hmm. um, it, it has a lot going on for it. Maybe it's not going to be every viewer's cup of tea, but I think it's – I wouldn't be surprised if it's – you know, top five picked best picture mm. for a lot of the people voting. You know, yeah. it, it'll be up there. It'll be up there for sure. Yeah, it will yeah. be. Yeah, but it won't win. Unfortunately. You don't think I, so? No, I, I don't mean, think I win. think I think if it were to win, that would be like a major surprise all of a sudden kind yeah. of thing. Unless I doubt they would go back and change their minds right now. But if Anatomy of a Fall did win. I would be like, wow, that's like the second time. It would be in a way amazing because then I would be like, like this is like the second or so time an international feature finally yeah. won Best Picture because yeah. first time was Parasite. Right, right. Ago. It would be a follow up <laughs> after yeah. what Parasite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if they're gonna do a Parasite because Parasite swept and that that was funny. That was the Oscars right before the pandemic happened. Oh right. hell yeah! So right. we, we weren't even thinking about COVID very no, much. No, no, yeah. no. We no, we weren't. But yeah, oh. I mean, Parasite is a movie that you can. <laughs> It, there's so many holy shit moments in that movie, right? That you you can't help but see it again and again. I mean, like when everything just goes to hell at the final party, right? That's a scene that you know I could watch a million times, <laughs> right? You know, j j just to see how south everything goes. Yeah, but yeah, Anatomy of a Fall though, it's a much more subtle film than Parasite. Yes, and it's a it's a movie that requires repeat viewings. Because you're not going to get every detail of the case, but yeah, the more you get, the more rewarding it is. For sure, and I, well, and I, I also wonder if it's the type of movie that, with every viewing, you have a different opinion. You know, the first time you view it, you're yeah. like, "Oh, she did it." The second time you view it, you're like, "Wait a minute, no, she didn't do it." The third time you watched it, right. you're like, "Wait a minute, no, I do." You know, yeah. like I, I think you'd be waving back and forth uh -huh. before you watch it. And you're also thinking is like, like her mind is probably mentally drained. Oh right yeah, now, like, and, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think. Yeah. Like the viewer is mentally drained after watching that movie, yeah, and that's, just like how the main character, yeah, is. You, <laughs> know, after you go for the ride here. on this thing of just how exhausting mm -hmm. you know a and, trial can be. And, and I don't recall like in a trial film. Sometimes I was thinking, would there be like a polygraph or anything? But then the reason why they wouldn't do that is because I'm sure polygraphs are proven ineffective. But imagine if they did have that; that would probably add a layer yeah. of some type of totally. extra anxiety that would be enticing. Well, I'll way. never listen to Fifty Cent's Pimp this <laughs> ever, again. ever again. Yeah. Ever no. again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just over and over, over and yeah. over. Yep. Yeah. Quite quite a version of it too. <laughs> with the steel drum. Yeah. Yeah. Just just the uh, <laughs> instrumental. Yeah. Just the instrumental version. Yeah. But yeah, moving on, we got. Probably the weirdest nominee of them all, and that's Poor Things. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. Oh, boy. Poor For Things. For sure. I, that is Yargos Lanfamos. Truly is one where I, Emma Stone, I will say, has just got guts in that role. Yes. Oh, yeah. That is the most audacious and very, I'm going to say, hard for me to say. The one role where she is the most sexually aroused I've ever seen her, but she it was just, it is pure Lanfamos, if you've seen his previous. This is where he, like, wants to mend someone who has 
loneliness issues in a completely different universe. And I also view it almost like almost like young Frankenstein, but young Frankenstein yeah, it is. Meet, 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 meet sexual scenarios. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It reminded me of that scene in Young Frankenstein where he runs into the German girl in the graveyard and they have sex. <laughs> like, yes. th th this movie is just horny Frankenstein. Sure, yeah. You know, because it, it, it's a film that Yorgos Lanthimos doesn't just make weird movies for the sake of being weird. Right. Although some people can argue that. Like, I, I think uh, Inland Empire from David Lynch is weird for the sake of being weird. He okay. just kind of wrote shit <laughs> yeah. in that movie. Uh, th this one is saying something about polite society. Sure. How we're all supposed to be very genteel with one another, but yet, you know, we're sexual creatures. Yeah, we're totally. Kind of bang. Yes. Yeah. And, like, the middle act of this movie <laughs> is just Emma Stone having sex with guy after guy after guy. Right. And it's because she's trying to, like you said, she's trying to discover herself through loneliness because they, they, they give her sort of just like in Frankenstein, they give her an, uh, 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 an indeveloped brain. Right. And then through that, she develops, uh, uh, I think, a viewpoint of society that a lot of other people <laughs> can't see. Yeah. But she can because she's just not afraid to do all the crazy things that she can do. And there's especially right. that quote with her kind of thing where even in those moments where she's like having sex, 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 where she's like, why don't people just do this all the time? Then I'm just thinking, well, people probably have, people have limits, obviously. Yeah. And she does not understand that in her head. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, it's funny. I think <laughs> this is one of like Lanthimos's more conventional movies comparatively. You know, you look at Dogtooth and you look at, you know, uh, like the, the lobster. lobster yeah, yeah, right. Killing like, of a sacred deer. Yeah, <laughs> it, it does feel like it's more conventional because it's it it is sort of as you said, Mike. It's copying off of sort of Frankenstein, yeah. Mary Shelley's story. But I do think what, what what's interesting about it is is that it really kind of feels like a you know is it coming through the eyes of a child kind of thing. Like yeah. She mm -hmm. she very much is a is a freshly newborn baby yes. well she has a baby's brain a baby's brain yeah. growing <laughs> and, and we grow along with yeah. her yes. and and you kind of you know some of the most people always say like the most honest stuff comes from the mouths of kids and, and yeah. she is an honest person and very forthcoming unlike as you said you talked about polite society yeah unlike people who will act fake or act silly just for the fake, uh, for the sake of not embarrassing themselves or not, you know, yeah. being too forward. Mm -hmm. And and I think like her her liberation and her sort of freedom is what's so great about this movie. It's oh, such yeah. a freeing film. You yeah, mean? and yeah. Frankenstein isn't a monster himself, or right. the Frankenstein Doctor, or Doctor Goodwin, or Godwin, yep, yep. as they call it, him in yep. the movie. It was Will Defoe, yeah, yeah. He was he was like he was kind of like this this trusting fatherly figure. But right, he, but he did let, you know, the she he did let the monster go out and or Bella he let her go out and do whatever the hell yeah. she wanted. Right, and you know he wasn't over controlling in that matter. And yeah, <laughs> it was it, it was a movie about freedom and discovery. Yeah, and yeah. It, it was it was about that through like some of the most perverse ways you can imagine. Sure. But at the same time, that's just what people and, do. And, I, right, and right. I will and I will even say, like 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 what you said, Leo, like how she's like like it's like her brain is the mind of a child, almost like and even outside her lewd activities. Like it makes you think, Oh, when I was a child, I didn't like this stuff. But then later on you start like and she's like, Why would I eat this if it's revolting? Right. It's like as over time, over years, your taste buds I mean she does not understand that, which is why there's joy to this movie or she thinks it's okay to act out in scenarios when there isn't especially if the line she's like I'm gonna go punch that baby you're like no no right, but, right. And that, that's where this film <laughs> finds its heart and its light yeah, and it, I understand it, by conventional right like, right like it, it tries to sort of find <laughs> where the lines are of life right yeah. like what's okay what what yeah. what you can do and what you can't do and I yeah and I, I like the way it just sort of tests things I, I'm always a huge fan of movies that challenge viewers uh, Lanthimos never, you know, isn't going to challenge the viewer yeah. and make you say like, "Hey, you have to watch something different for once in your life. Yeah. You have to watch a movie where a woman is sexually mm -hmm. liberated and watch a movie where she is enjoying sex." Because you know, yeah. like God forbid that that happened. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like th there is a very honest and freeing sort of aspect to his films that I I genuinely appreciate. Yeah, like he shows people kind of at their most primordial. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, yeah. habits, but that, that that but that's what makes it work. Yeah, is that he's honest about people. Yeah, and he's honest about their behaviors and you know what what happens behind closed doors, and he incorporates it into some of the strange. I mean, the the cinematography in this movie is absolutely. Breath- uh, amazing, yeah, breathtaking. Yeah, honestly, yeah. At times. I think it's better than Oppenheimer's. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, it, it's certainly uh, more inventive in terms of just like it, you know, every frame looks like it's a painting. It yeah. looks like very odd, you know, Art Deco paintings or things that we you, you would see at a, at the Art Institute. It's, it's yeah, a Picasso at times. It's like amazing. when she's on the boat and there's that whole mm-hmm. digital background, totally. but it looks like a painting instead of a digital background. Yeah, when I'm, she's in the middle of Glasgow, yeah, and the whole city. He just kind of looks like a big set from like Disney World just to highlight how she thinks the world is kind of fake. Yeah. You know, you, you get all of that in there. I love the use of the fish islands that is in the movie. He doesn't he overdo gets... it the way he did in The Favorite as yeah. well, which is nice. I, f- yeah. I feel like this one is one where, and I, and I agree with you, like, like doesn't overdo it. Like, I feel like this was like one where it's almost a little bit of The Favorite, a little bit of The Lobster, and then of course kind of then a little bit of killing of his sacred deer like all kind of compiled from like how he would view someone's mind how he would view how they may take society or yep. how their behaviors may be but however he's found it he's found his odd character of who he's created which is a mesmerizing when he found stone's performance to be in a world of pure imagination almost like the world of wonka but this time in the world of of of, of a newborn brain and adult body truly <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's it's it's, <laughs> uh, it's a twisted film, but it it has a purpose. Oh yeah, it does. Yes. Yes. it has it has meaning as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it got nominated for eleven Oscars, I think. Yeah. Wow. Well, oh I, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's costume department. You know, when Emma Stone's wearing clothes in the film is right. You know, real good and. Uh, you know, set the, design, the set design is that. amazing. The yep. cinematography, like all that, is across the board, like right. really well executed. Yeah, and yeah. That, that's what makes the movie work. Yep. But then, yeah, when we talk about good cinematography, I think of all the uh, geometrical shots in the zone of interest. Oh boy. Which, yeah, yeah. That 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 was a movie that. Uh, <laughs> It's a Holocaust movie that doesn't play by the conventions of all the other Holocaust films. We're yeah. not seeing the horrors of what's happening right up front, but rather behind closed doors, which is what makes it all the more terrifying. Right. You know, you, you, the, the, we have this Haas family who basically works for this guy, uh, played by Christian Friedolf, yep. and uh, he's, he plays uh, Rudolf Haas, Haas, and he's, like basically it's a, it, it, it's a home... Across the street from, you know, the concentration camps. Right. And the the biggest inconvenience for, you know, everyone who lives in that home is hearing the distant screams right. of the people who are being killed, you know, just, just down the road from them. Right. And it, it's a movie where you get frustrated by just how blase everyone is about this shit happening around right. them. You know, uh, right. they're, they're talking about getting their pool right. They're they're going around. There's a scene where Sandra Huller you know, again, Sandra Huller. Very but good. She's, always, yep. Yeah, she's she's giving Christian Friedel a bunch of shit because he's got to transfer to another station and it's not going to be where they live. And you're thinking, wow, they care about this, but not about all the people getting incinerated next right. door. Yeah, I mean, and he sets that tone pretty early, too, with, you know, there's yeah. there, there's parts where they're trying on clothes that they have brought over from, which is clearly clothes of people that that has been taken from people and people that have been killed. There are scenes where he's trying on watches that are new and things that, you know, he feels like are, are new, uh, you know, possessions for him to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, you know, directed by Jonathan Glazer. It is... By far, in my opinion, it's the one where I'm like, yes, out of at least out of the best picture movies, this is the one that I'm like, this is made perfectly. It, it you know what I mean? He takes meticulous time and, and, and you know moments to make this movie. I wasn't blown away the most by it because it just, yeah. as you were saying, there's there's a distance. There's a distance from this movie. Yeah, it's very intentionally distant, but it's so yeah. distant that, you know, like how many times can I just watch long shots of someone walking around a house? Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, obviously it's all part of his intention. I think the craft is there. I think he, you know, I talked about this with some of our other 
uh, fellow CIC members about yes. how I think it's actually one of Glazer's least, you know, complicated movies, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think he's, he's, it, it's the simplest movie he's made yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet, um, you know, he, it says a lot with what he's doing, but it just wasn't the movie that made me say, oh, this is his best work, you know? Yeah. I, I think a lot of directors could have made this movie, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, Glazer always wants to challenge the viewer. It certainly does that. Yeah, and and even like like you said, Mike, like with um with like how there's stuff going on in this film outside the camp, like 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 it kind of gives you the idea where it just like like you know like like this family, they're thinking, okay, do we really deserve what we're doing right now? Like right. like do we deserve all this around us, even though we have no choice because I could tell it's almost like an experience where even when I was watching it, I would just think to myself, what's on the other side? Yeah. You know, like, like, do they truly like what they like or are they just in it for the authority? Are they in it just or and I, even though they may not mm. have a choice, it makes you just think yeah. kind of how can you just live in a society where you have it good? But knowing right down the street, from you, all of this is still going on. Glazier, like you said, his most simplest film, I think it's like. A film where it like just kind of like really dives into like 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 dynamics of what may 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 make it seem like people are almost living like the life of celebrities, even though they're not. They're just there because they can be or right. they're assigned to be. But yeah. but that's but yeah, Jonathan Glazier, like like the direction of this, I like like it made me think, okay, they may have this life while this is going on in the world, but but are but are they really in for it? Honestly, yeah. Like, like what I mean is, do they enjoy it? Because right. it seemed because you could tell sides of them do and sides of them don't. Yeah. Well, there, there, and there's that whole haunting scene in the beginning where they're telling Rudolph how to control the ovens to burn all the Jews. Oh uh, yeah. Oh god, yeah. don't he, get me started. And and they're just and they're just like sitting casually in his home having tea over it. <laughs> right. And, like, okay, well, you just have it at this temperature, and then you do that. And I'm, I'm but, just thinking, Jesus. Christ. Right. Christ. Yeah, there, there's such a like lackadaisical sort of yeah. approach to it all that is the point, right? That is the most terrifying part that, of it all. That people are what people are capable and, of, and yeah. So and, and yeah, he he nails all of that. I just don't. It's just not the type of movie that sort of. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to say. It's just not, you know, there have been a lot of Holocaust movies in the history of cinema. There's been a lot of movies like Schindler's List yes. yeah. and, and films of this nature that have done it maybe a little bit more in your face, but yet also still getting that point across. And I think, um, you know, maybe it, there is a sort of sense for audience viewers that they're saying to themselves, well, you know, we've seen a lot of movies like this and, and, and that makes it a little bit harder for the zone of interest to be, you know, in the top five of the 10. Yeah. And, and even with like zone of interest, like what you said, Leo, there's been many Holocaust movies. I even remember researching uh, Schindler's just a bit take as about zone of interest and best categories. And even looking back at how zone of interest and even how this almost in a way, I feel there's a connection to schindler's list like how we said kind of you know that oven scenario like i'm thinking okay that is probably the most emotional part of a holocaust movie and and i look back to schindler's list because back then i heard many of the people who lived through that era who were part of that movie like we can't do this right now which is why they kept hitting all kinds of plateaus with that movie but i think zone of interest with its simple plot that's why they didn't go that route yeah i think think they're like okay this has been established in so many movies let's not have this concept right right kind of thing yeah Yep. Yeah, intense film, but uh, yeah, it's it's not. I don't know. I I have that tied with Anatomy of a Fall for like my favorite uh, foreign language film because yeah. at first it was it was sort of interest. So then I saw Anatomy of a Fall again. I'm like, wow, I'm getting so much more out of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, when I Zone of Interest though. Um, that was very when I saw that of being at the Chicago International Film Festival. That really was one that was true for Chicago International Film Festival for sure. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like I want more international titles like this at the festival. Truly, totally, if they label yeah. this. Although this way. It, it wasn't even international though. I think it was from the UK, wasn't it? In a way, almost yeah. along the lines. Yeah, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But then we, so then we go down here, and uh, this movie, I liked it a lot when I first saw it. But then I saw it again, and I'm like, this is missing a lot, and that's Maestro. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ma- Maestro, it's like, it's brilliantly directed, uh, but it's a bit shallow because yeah. you don't learn a lot about Leonard Bernstein in this movie. Yeah. You get that he's bisexual, 
and that he's been seeing other guys, and his wife's kind of okay with that because she doesn't want. Well, she's not okay with it, right? But she lets it happen because she doesn't want to ruin his life. Yeah. And outside of that, you just get a lot of like pretty scenes of him composing and talking, and he's got that big fake nose, and he's got that big like. In terms of the acting, Bradley Cooper's performance isn't that good in it, to right. be honest. You know, right. he's just kind of doing this this voice this whole time. Yeah, he I'm, sounds like he has a cold. Uh, yeah, I yeah. mean, I mean, I will say, I mean, I I'm kind of a few if, on that mic. Like, I enjoyed it the first time because it was like an experience. Then look, if I. Had to look back. I'm thinking, okay, a lot of Maestro. I mean, even though I did enjoy Maestro on many levels, still there is moments where it is kind of repetitive between the different fragments of Cooper, like between, like you said, the old voice, the composing, having having frequent cigarettes in almost every moment, right, right, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, Maestro is honestly out of the ten the only movie that I would have given a negative review to. I, I didn't, mm. I didn't give a review for Maestro. You know, I saw it much farther down the line um, yeah. but it was the one movie that I was just like man you know it it didn't as Mike said it didn't do enough to explain to me you know what it was about Bernstein that made him who he was what yeah. it was about his conducting his style his way of 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 writing music that was so spectacular and I don't even you know I typically give applause to a movie that is the unconventional biopic like yeah you know I hate movies like um you know Bohemian Rhapsody things Ugh. that like you know, movies <laughs> yeah. that that just go through the notes of of you know of biopics where you know this moment is so important it's like the Dewey Cox thing oh yeah. god and I think and I think and I think Maestro you know, doesn't do any of those things, and yet it feels like it's not really giving me anything to hold on to. I, yeah. a, as Mike said, Bradley Cooper's performance is way too over the top, way too indulgent. Yeah. Um, even Carrie Mulligan's performance, I, I thought out of these, out of the acting performances for Best Actress, I thought hers is the one that should have been removed and replaced with Roby as well. I, oh, wow. You know, like, okay. I don't think, I, I, you know, I just know that she's been better in stuff, you know? It it's, kind of, it's kind of it's, like one of those weird. things. It's weird. I thought she was good in it. I thought she yeah. was acting circles around Bradley totally. Cooper in the movie. Yeah, that is 100% yeah. true. Because yeah. she has to, like, she has to give the most emotion because her character, I mean, yeah. spoiler, but then again, these are real people, so yeah. it's not really a spoiler. She gets breast cancer. Right. You know, and she has to react to all of that. Yeah, yeah, you know, totally. Dying on camera and all that. Stuff. It, and, she, and she nails that stuff. Yep. But it, it, it seems like she was like the real emotional arc of the story. Like, what was the main conflict between it, the two? Yeah. There was, there was like this scene where they're in the middle of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade or it's happening outside their outside their window. Yep. There's a big Snoopy float going by. Yep. And she's having an argument with him that his work comes from a place of hate and not love. Right. And then immediately after that scene, there's, and this is the scene that sells the movie, where Bradley Cooper is conducting the yeah. orchestra in the middle of the church. And, right. ah, you know, it's a gorgeous scene. I love it. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, he comes up to her, and then she hugs him, and she's like, no, your place is from love. And I'm like, well, where did she come up with that um, idea? Because yeah. he did a good job it's, it's composing. A, it's, a film where the, it's a film where the, like, where the dramatics, in a way, are misconstrued of how their approach like there are times where even cooper's performance is trying to talk to his children about weird things going on in his life and then you're just like okay he's not really approaching these conversations in like the perspective of trying to have a form of connection it's more right. along the lines where it's like i could tell thinking back to it that it was stuff that was kind of rushed when it was written like you would think in those moments that they want to do more character analysis but there wasn't any of that it was more just like don't think about this don't think yeah. about this yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it's kind of it felt like the point of the <laughs> script and the point of his storytelling was to show that he shut everybody around him out of his life hmm. and by doing that he also shuts the audience out yes. of his life so we do not <laughs> understand what he's going through entirely we feel shut out we want more details and and because of that the movie really struggles yeah it, it doesn't give us what you know what we want from a narrative it's like a love letter well it is a love letter to leonard bernstein but it's so much of a love letter it forgets to <laughs> talk about what's wrong with the guy <laughs> right, right you right. know and, and that's what made it so uh 
unengaging yeah. when I watched it. I'm I'm like the first time I saw it, I'm like, oh, this is gorgeously done. Yeah. And the second time I saw it, I'm like, yeah, this is gorgeously shot. This is gorgeously directed. I right. give Bradley Cooper all the credit in the world for actually learning composing for five years to do the whole church scene. Yep. But at the end of the day, you're going, yeah, but it doesn't leave me with much to chew on. Right. It's just a shallow kind of character piece. Yeah. That you know is is more of Oscar bait than anything. <laughs> right. This movie really is. I mean, you got you got the movie about a famous figure. You got the dying wife. <laughs> right. You know, you you got all the you you got the bisexual relationship. You got all the check marks for best picture. Right. And Netflix is going hard at this for best picture. Oh, yeah. they are sending us a lot of shit for it. <laughs> yeah. Which hey, I, I can't complain. I love the book list. I love As all that do stuff. I. But. It's not the best picture. It's not even close to it. So yeah, it was a it, it it's a movie that didn't uh, live up like the other times I've seen it. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, but then uh, moving on from that, we got the holdovers. Which, yeah, yeah, Hold- that movie that movie took me by surprise by how much I really liked it. Totally. You know, because th- this is a film that's just about like three groups of misfits who are stuck in a school together. Who have to kind of get together during the holiday season? I know Alexander Payne detests the fact that people call this a Christmas movie, <laughs> right? But it is a Christmas yeah, movie. Yeah, but it's very much about people who don't have a family during Christmas or right. who've had like their son die, right? Who get together during the holiday season, and is it is a it's a very heartwarming picture, especially Paul Giamatti, and I think this is what's going to get him in the Oscar. Yeah, and I wrote it in my notes here. It's it's like at the end of the film when he kind of has his little retail, retaliatory moment against his employer. Yep. And then he calls the dean of the school a penis head. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Like those kind of like bits of dialogue are so believable and so great. Yeah. You know, he has the scene where um, I'm trying to remember the kid's name in the movie, but uh, Agnes, right? Yeah. He's played by Dominic Sessa, yeah. and uh, there's that scene where he's jumping around in the uh, gymnasium and he breaks his arm when he's <laughs> yeah, trying to rebel yeah. against the teacher. Right. Like, all those moments feel very real. And this is a movie with very real moments, with very real characters who have their awkward, funny uh, sort of occasions. Right. right. And and it comes together in this, in this, in this beautiful picture about... Trying to find someone who means something to you uh, right. during a time of year when everyone wants to find someone. Uh, totally. And even with Paul Giamatti, like I think back and I love the films of Alexander Payne. I love many of them, one of which is Sideways, which also had Giamatti, and that's an awesome movie. But I, yeah. one, well, here's the thing with, with what I love about Sideways and Paul Giamatti even now. like Paul Giamatti's performance in the hold- hold- Holdovers is on par with his brilliant performance in Sideways almost two decades later. Now, now even though Giamatti has his character of frustration, it's like, G- like Alexander Payne knows how to direct a character. It's like someone has frustration then also finds a heart in the moments of his frustration. Like yeah. going out of his way to actually help this kid as totally. he did as his character trying to help his friend in, in Sideways. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah, I don't think like, I don't even think like the dialogue at all times of this movie is necessarily perfect, but like yeah. Payne has this really unbelievable way of um, making movies about finding a family, yeah. making movies about people who are, as you were saying, Tarek, like people who are isolated and people who, you know, are lonely and in need of that sort of connection. Um, and, you know, and The Holdovers feels kind of classic in that yeah. way, right? It, I mean, it, it feels very old school Capra, old well, it's, school. It's even done of, in an old school way. They shoot it, shoot it in like it's almost four by three format close to it. Yeah. Not quite. And then they, they kind of have the film grains that they put on there. Although it's filmed on digital, they, they put right. like the little grains on there to make it feel like yeah, you're Yeah, so it does have a very cool like throwback look, the costuming yeah. and all that. And yeah, and I think where he, where he sort of wins, as Mike said too, like the scene where he breaks his arm. It's like uh-huh. he wins with like silly moments like that where yeah. these characters have to sort of react and and, uh-huh. and be okay with each other and be stuck in these situations. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's one of the sweeter movies of the year. I always love a movie that's about you know, finding your family, making your yeah. family instead of the family that you actually were born into. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, one, definitely one of the more warm-hearted movies that's on the list it, for Best Picture. It's, it's Payne, definitely. Payne's writing knows how 
to make his characters be able to accept things for what they are. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it is. And that's why I love Holder. It feels natural. Like something you don't want to, you could tell the characters don't want to deal with it, but they find a way to deal with it anyway. And then they find the charm out of it. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's the thing. It's a, it's a charming movie about characters who don't feel like, well, I mean, they feel like characters, but they don't feel like characters. They right. feel like people right. we can know. Yes. You know, yeah. And th- I mean, like Dominic Sessa is just a standard kind of bratty kid. Right. But then we learn why he's such a brat. Right. And then, you know, we, we feel bad for him. Paul Giamatti is this guy who had this real prestigious job, but then he lost it because he was a little too outspoken in what he did. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then, of course, you got... Um, Divine, Divine Joy Jordan. Randolph, yep. who you know lost her son in the Vietnam War, right? And you know she she's just this lonely uh, school the uh, 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 cook, yeah. Who you know basically is just trying to get through her life. When, yeah, <laughs> yeah. During the Christmas season, her son's dead, so she just chain smokes and just deals with that the whole time. Right. I don't know. She's probably going to win for her best supporting actress. Yeah, it seems I like she's actually probably one. the only lock. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it seems like she's taken almost every award, and now she's, you know, now she's hopefully going to go home with the Oscar. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see indeed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, moving on, we got, now if you thought the Irishman was bloated, <laughs> Wait till you get to the Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh boy! <laughs> you know, and here's the thing with the Irishman: it was long, but at least you kind of got the length because it was about a guy who, uh, you know, Robert De Niro's character. I can't remember the name of it at the top of my head. It was like Frank something, uh, but he, you get his life as it's going through the years with Jimmy Hoffa mm-hmm. and how the times have changed. And, you know, you go, you get him from, like, 30 years old to being an old man, although when he's 30 years old with a de-aging, he looks yep. like he's fucking 50. Right. But, you know, that's a whole other thing. Yep. Like, at least you get, like, a storied structure yeah. around all that huge length where you understand how that time has passed on. Right. With Killers of the Flower Moon, you don't get much of an idea of how much time has gone by. It's mostly just three and a half hours of people getting killed right. and be- as a direct result of Robert De Niro's character, King Hale. Yeah. And, you know, and you got uh, Ernest, uh, what's his last name? Burkhart. Burkhart, thank yeah. you. I was going to say yeah. Bernstein, and I yep. would have yep. fucked that up. This is definitely one of Martin Scorsese's. More psychologically intense films. Yes, there is many moments of violence, but it wasn't like repetitive like some of his other ones. What I mean by psychologically intense, like you could tell in the conversations, and something happens, like destruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People losing their homes, people getting murdered. But it happens more like after something psychological happens. Kind of like that scene where there's, um, like, you know, one of the officers uh, played by Jesse Plemons going to Leonardo DiCaprio's main character be like, I want to see about these murders, see what about them. So he was doing it. You could just tell yeah. that there's, like, corruption all hidden. It's getting worse. In yeah, such a way. I, you know, I, I, it's not that I totally disagree with what Mike's saying, because, like, I think, I, I do think it has three-act structure. I just think it's, like, those those that middle section as mike talked about where it literally is just murder after murder after murder is the only section that feels the yes. like the the bloat as exactly call it. like it yeah. really is the part where you're like okay he could have cut that down maybe yeah and again going back to what scorsese's style is his style is the redundancy yes. and his style is just hammering it home to show that like it just kept happening and kept happening and kept going yeah. and kept going kept going and i think like yeah it has that intro where the where the two of them sort of like fall in where you know we're introduced to the the world that he's in the people that are around him him falling in love with her the middle part is all the murder and then the end is sort of the police investigation yeah yes. and um i think uh you know i'm i'm a huge fan of this movie so you know i am you know partially on the side that thinking that this movie speaks so much more to sort of American history than people are giving it credit. It, it, yeah. you know, is this type of movie that sort of holds a, holds a mirror up to how this country was made and put together. Um, but I, you know, I understand a lot of people's complaints about it. A lot, you know, the complaints that Molly, the, that, uh, Lily Gladstone's character doesn't get enough to do. Yeah. Um, but you know, 
But man, it but that's because re- he was like poisoning her. Yeah, the whole time. I mean, exactly, exactly. I mean, but man, it, but craft wise, I mean, this movie, I think from a craft standpoint, for like what the credit we give to Maestro, this movie does it better. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like putting all of that cinematography, editing, all of that stuff into it, and it's like, oh, okay, I get it. I get why this is, you know praised and and nominated for best picture the 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 maestro stuff yeah it's there it's all there but again the story really doesn't help it you know yeah yeah well i felt like the story like you were saying it was just kind of repetitive at a certain point yeah yeah. you know i i felt like i was just watching the same scene over and over again right because because the, the the funny thing is martin scorsese says oh i'm taking this movie from the osage perspective i'm yeah. like well, it's not really from the Osage's perspective. Right. It's through Leonardo DiCaprio's perspective and how he's offing all these people for yeah. his for his uncle so he can make more money. Right. You know, and 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 I guess you can argue that maybe he was in love with Molly, but I doubt it. Right. You know, after all the shit he did to her and he was like poisoning her with the with the insulin and all that, like no. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think like that part is an interesting thing to sort of study in this film. Like, and I think he wanted to sort of get to that. Whether you question, you know, you throw it out there if he does love her or not. It's very like strange. Like, can you be such a sadistic and disgusting person who, as you said, who's poisoning her yeah. constantly, and then at the end still say, like, you love someone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really think sort of that is one of the, like, co- complex cruxes of this movie where it's just like, okay, are we supposed to actually believe that this guy loved her in yeah. any way, shape, or form when he's not even <laughs> able to sort it- of... Uh, turn her you know actually turn himself in and and say yeah i did this when when the moment hits him and it's kind of again you relate that to a lot of people in today's day and age where they're not able to sort of turn against somebody when we've seen how ugly they can be yeah you know yeah yeah i mean uh you know so it it was in my top 10 of the year i mean i'm i'm one of the people that really love this film but um you know, I don't think it is. I don't, I, you know, it's kind of one of those questions that everybody's asking is Scorsese, is another of his films going to go home empty handed with, with the Oscars? I don't think that's going to happen because I do think Lily Gladstone. Yeah, is I think gonna Lily's going to win it. They're going to make up for what happened with Marlon Brando when Sh- Sashin Little. Sure, Little in a way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and um, yeah, but I, I, I do think. This movie is a lot different than uh, The Irishman. I think it doesn't have yeah. some of those technical problems that, like you talked about, Michael, <laughs> the, the with the de-aging. De-aging and, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I, but I, I think um, it, you know, it's a movie that will be appreciated with mul- more with multiple viewings. I think, but at the same time, too, it, you know, the length is is a hard thing for people to sort of digest i think the repetitiveness is going to be hard for people to digest so i think its chances of winning best picture are very very slim i think that's not gonna win you know i think you know if i had to put together like a top five i think oppenheimer's the winner and then behind that is poor things Mm. uh past lives killers of the flower moon you know those ones are kind of the ones that are will be hovering around and and then anatomy of a fall so yeah Sorry, I was uh, signaling Alex. You're in the frame. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it'll be interesting to see if it picks up any speed or you know gains any momentum from the fact that you know the Academy loves Scorsese, loves big movies like this. Yeah, I just don't think you know if it won, I would be shocked. I would be shocked. Absolutely as, shocked. I would be shocked as well because even if that filming. It did make my top ten as well, but even then, I'm just thinking that the, like the different approach of this film, in a way, like from in its writing, I'm thinking this. Not saying it's bad form of writing, yeah. but this is like one where it really wants to pace itself. Kind yeah. of so, so yeah. and even in that long time frame of over, of being over three hours and twenty minutes, almost literally at two hundred minutes. Yeah. Like I'm just thinking this one is very into dynamics and pacing itself, but right. like and. It's very different, but I do believe, you know, it's going to receive some forms of appreciation, but I really doubt it will in the best picture mode. Yeah. No, right? it's not. No, gonna, never, not at all. He already, he already <laughs> won for The Departed, and I think that's, that's that always going to win for, 
after that. Right. You know, be, right. and I mean, that's fine. I was happy when he won The Departed, you know. Yeah, that, that, that was yes. more of like an appreciation Oscar. Right. And you knew they were going to give it to him because they had George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Francis Ford Coppola right. approach the stage and they were going <laughs> to give it to him. So, so you knew, like, oh, okay, this is going to be yes. it. Right. You know, and they, I would be weird if they came, came up to the stage and gave it to Stephen Frears, which <laughs> yeah. George, George Lucas fucked up his name when he said it, too. He called him Stephen Fears. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've always noticed that when I watch. Way to go, it. George. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's not the best at writing. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that explains a lot. Yeah. Oh, man. But yeah, I killed his flower move. Like, here's the thing I enjoyed it. I did list it as one of my top 10 of the year, but then as time has went on and I saw it a couple more times after I saw it the first time, yeah. I tried to rewatch as many of these films as I could. Yeah. I'm just going, boy, you know, this, this, it doesn't feel long. But at the same time, it is long. Right. And it's not the good kind of long. Right. It feels ugh. it feels uh, like you're just watching. Uh, you're, it feels like another Scorsese film, which isn't a bad thing. Like, yeah. th- you can never get enough Scorsese films. Right. But it feels like a film that is unnecessarily brutal sometimes yeah. where you're getting so many of these killings, but you don't really learn much about the soul sage community and who they are. And yeah, what make like, yeah, yeah. Scorsese says, Oh, we learned about him. And we put him in eh, Not really. And then there's the whole bit where he puts himself at the end of the radio play mm-hmm. where they're dramatizing what happened to Ernest and all these guys. And Martin Scorsese comes up on the stage himself Right. And then he starts telling you what the end of the movie is. And I'm like, okay, this is just a director posing for it. He's pulling like a Spike Lee. Right. You know, he's, he's coming in front of the camera and he's making himself front and center saying, I made this movie because of this. And I'm like, well, we don't really need that. You know, <laughs> yeah, we yeah, kind of yeah. get the idea. Yeah. But yeah, it didn't, it didn't really live up for me. But yeah, that was past, uh, not past lies. Past lies is my next one. Yeah. yeah but past <laughs> that lies. was Killers of the Flower Moon. I mean, when I talk past lies, these guys got killed all the time. Maybe they got some past <laughs> lies as like an Osage yeah. uh, <laughs> spirit or something. Like that. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, no, but, but we go into past lives. And this movie was beautiful because it was a realistic take of time and love lost. It never feels forced. None of the characters are vilified. Right. You know, everyone is believable. Arthur, who's played by John Magaro, or however he's... John Magaro. Magaro, yep. yeah. Yep. You know, he isn't the over-controlling, like he says in the film, he's like, I'm not the over-controlling husband who's standing in the way of destiny. Right. Uh, Nora isn't a confused woman who's in love, who can't decide who to choose to be with. And hey, Sung isn't the pretty boy that's in the way of life. Like, you know, every right. everyone's just these people trying to survive, trying to go yeah. about their day. And the way they implement social media is great yeah. because they reconnect through Facebook right. and then they interact with each other on Skype. Right. And it just reminds me of so many people where I've gotten into, like someone who I've like, I haven't seen them since the fifth grade. And all of a sudden here they are on Facebook and they're like right. a stockbroker now, Yeah, you know, and it, it, it's really about how we reconnect with people through social media and how our lives change and how, you know, maybe we don't get to be together with the one we love, but in some other life we did because yeah. it, it goes with the whole, uh, I'm trying to, ah, oh, here it is. It's the Inyon proverb, a Korean proverb saying, like, even if you brush clothes with someone, somehow you shared a life together. Oh, and that's a beautiful sentiment. Yes, it know, is. Because, yeah. because you think, yeah, maybe these guys did share some other life together where they were in love and they were happy. Right. And y- but yeah, it wasn't it, this it, one. It's, it kind of asks that question of like, what if I zigged instead of zagged kind of thing? Okay. And yeah. Like, you know, um, I love that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really nice that you brought that up. I mean, I think like the, that's the entirely the message of this movie of what could have been. We all have those questions. Yeah. And, um, you know, past lives is one of the most beautiful movies of the year. It was yeah. always in my top five all year. Yeah. I think it's honestly the 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 biggest sleeper. If there's one movie that yeah. I think that could big the, be yeah. the upset is this. It's possibly this because the the Academy, you know, they loved a movie like Coda. Mm-hmm. They love a heartfelt story, a movie that, you know, is sentimental and brings everybody together in a way. Um 
it is really a beautiful film. I, you're you're one hundred percent right with you know with your kind of like leaning on it. I I don't think it's gonna win. It no, won't. no. But you know, but it does have this nice long shot. And and if it did win, that would be great. I would just be ecstatic. Yeah. You know, Greta Lee is so so great in this. Yeah. And um, yeah, really a beautiful film. I I, I know you know we recommended it to everybody and, this year. And I will say <laughs> it was kind. It was an experience for us how we got to see that film because I remember it, we got to see it in uh, the Chicago Critics Film Fest, and just that yeah. film alone is just a film that fits in that fest in a way. Like totally. films yeah. for, that are festival have meaning and empathy, and even with past lives, like where I felt even though like like some people may have taken it differently, but I just felt. It's mesmerizing tone is just deep where it's like, you know, like in the connection of the two characters, how one is married, but then how one connects with their friend again and they want to learn things about one another. It just kind of gives the idea where it's like someone in your life, even if they weren't a big importance, does not have to be completely dismissed. Totally. Honestly. It's finding friends in a way, but also kind of how how you move forward with with like with, with, with a sense of like finding your friends in the in the unlikely places right honestly. yeah yeah i mean yeah. It, you know it's also heartbreaking at times oh, it and it's also yeah it's friend zoned the movie yeah really it is and it's like <laughs> but it's also um you know as, as you said Tark, i think that's that's sort of one of its highlights is uh sorry i'm getting my thoughts together here um it's not you know, it's not pandering. It's not sort yeah. of, you know, it's so honest and earnest in what it's doing and what it's saying. Um, yeah, there's no hatred or anger, <laughs> right? He's yeah. not like, how could you? How could you do this to me? <laughs> it's more like these are just people who are adults. They're yeah. grown, grown. Yeah, adults there's no acting. dramatization. Yeah. It's all it's no. all just about real interactions. Yeah. I feel yeah. like I'm repeating myself a lot here. I'm like, anatomy of a fall is real. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, but it's, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you bring a good point. I mean, it, it, that's why... You want that authenticity, right? Yeah. It's a it's a word that film critics we use too many times, but like right. authenticity is a huge part of it. Yep. And I think honestly, out of all of these movies, I think that's why a lot of them are so so good. That that's why we have these ten movies. There's an yep. authentic sort of approach to these characters and the writing that makes them all sort of shine. It, you know, it, it this again. There's only one movie out of this 10 that I did not like, and that mm. says something. It's kind of one of the first years ever for the Oscars where I'm like, oh, they got, you know, six out of 10 wrong. You know, yeah. this is one of the first years where I'm like, well, they kind of <laughs> got it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was Maestro, right? Yeah. 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 Maestro, the Oscar bait movie. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it was great because you... You 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 don't get into the big like you were saying you don't get into the big dramatic scene. Yeah. You don't you don't have the husband saying to the wife, "Oh, you're connecting to this guy. What are you two doing?" When you meet <laughs> right. up? And you're like, yeah. "No, they're just friendly with each other." Right. There's no like and, emotional cheating, right? Yeah. Like he's he's not John McGarrow's character is not like, "How dare you go out with another no. guy?" You know, he's just like, "Okay, I trust you. You're an adult. Like, yeah. go ahead." It's, you know. It's almost like like even past lives, like even watching that film, to me it's kind of like a film where it's just like you know, it's like we may have, may, people may have others in their lives and past lives, remind reminds us of how sometimes how rewarding things can even be just to connect with a friend, go somewhere, enjoy life outside instead of living in a world where where we stare at our screens or fall in our introvert mode all the time. How nice it is actually have a face to face interaction. That's where I felt so touched by past. Like, I'm like, okay, these people want to connect, but it's just for the purpose of staying connected. Yeah, and truly. And a yeah. great, e great exercise yeah. in slow yeah. cinema, you know, because when, when uh, Nora meets up with, uh, I'm going to get his name wrong, but when she meets up with, when she meets up with her friend who she hasn't seen in Korea yeah. since they were a kid. Yeah. You're a kid since they were kids. Yeah. You know, you had that long shot of them holding each other, hugging each other, and then breaking away. Right. And you feel that feeling just with the camera staying there that they don't want to disconnect. Right. But yet they have to. Yeah. And they kind of repeat that at the very end of the film when, you know, she says goodbye to to her friend for the last time, and then she's hugging her husband. 
Yeah. And they, and she's crying, and they, and that was like the big emotional release of the scene. Right. Is that she, you know I'm giving it away, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah they're the, you know well you got to tell tell our viewers there's definitely spoilers on this. Oh one. yes. <laughs> well, <much> so. <laughs> you know, we're talking about our favorite movies of the year here. You yeah. know we're gonna get into some spoilers here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they never hook up in the end. There's no big sex scene between. <laughs> I mean, it would be funny if it became like poor things and right. they were just yeah. full on fucking banging in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that, that would <laughs> that would be an entirely different movie. That yeah. would be. Yeah, yeah. Lorgo, Yorgos Lathamos's poor thing, uh, not poor things, <laughs> past lives. Past lives. I would like to see. There you go. Oh, oh my god, it's... that would be insane. Oh yeah. yeah, Yorgos Lathamos taking on modern society. You're right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, I think that'd be a struggle. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But but the thing is, this film doesn't struggle with telling a very believable narrative. Right. About adults connecting. Yeah. And how, you know, how how time doesn't isn't always kind to us. Right. You know, we always have to uh, adjust to what's going to happen in life, how things are going to change, how the people we, you know, want to be with aren't going to be there anymore. But then they're back. But then we can't take them back. And yeah. And, you know, it's, it's all those sad little moments. We've all had the one that got away. Right. Yes. You know? Yeah. And this is this is a classic tale about the one that got away. That, right. You know, they they, they want to get back together, but they can't anymore. And, <laughs> and that's OK. Yeah. Because, you know, that was their past life. Right. You know, and then now they're living in their present life and they yeah. can't <laughs> quite get back to that. But yeah. yeah, we're moving on to our last one, though. American Fiction. Yeah. Uh, OK, so I rewatched this one again last night because luckily I had a screener. OK. And I didn't know if I was just being a brazen asshole when I was watching it. But I didn't give a shit about much of the family stuff in the movie. Really? Yeah. Okay. Like, okay, like, I get the mother's dying and Thelonious is trying to, you know, afford a, a better life for her, hence, which is why he wrote the book. Right. But but then it gets confused with all the stuff about the gay brother and how the mother doesn't accept him. And, and then there's the love story. And I'm like, okay, the gay brother could have been caught. The uh, cut, the the love story could have been cut, and you would have gotten the same thing. Because where this movie really shines in this trailer moments, yeah. you know, it's a movie about a guy who is sick of basically the precious books that come out, sure, and the stereotypical black novel. Right. So this guy's like, okay, pandering to the uh-huh. black community. Yeah. Right. So right. so he writes his own thing, which. That shit was fucking great. That was right. hilarious. Right. When when he's like, I'm gonna change the title of my book. Like to what? Fuck. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. Okay, we're gonna stick with it. What? Right. No, okay. It's, it's, you know, like that, all that stuff works great. Yeah. But then when they're getting back to the family stuff, I'm bored. I'm like, no, go back to the facade. Go back to him. Yeah, that's writing the fake book. It, it, it's the one movie out of the ten that definitely feels like it's got two separate movies going on at yeah, the same time. Yeah. I, but but I will say yeah. that I actually think. The movie can't work without the two. It's oh yeah, in, you know, you need like, the family stuff. But yeah, then you don't need that much of it's, it. You interesting. Know? It, yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's like his own life is a is a life that's both American and that's both fiction. It's like on one end, like 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 he's frustrated by how by by how a lot of his ideas are kind of facing halts or deficits, and on the other end, there's all that family stuff going on. It's like it, it's it's like he can be a success, right? But it's not success in the direction he wants it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He becomes like that guy. <laughs> who is that guy who got in trouble with Oprah Winfrey when he wrote a book? And it was called like a thousand little pieces. Okay. And then like it turned out that it wasn't true. Okay. And then Oprah put him on a show, and she's like, "How dare you make this up?" So, that sounds ass. sounds yeah. It sounds vaguely, like something Oprah would yeah, do. Well, and it sounds yeah. like something that could have happened in this world. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that, that, that was the thing in the end. He goes on stage. He says, "I have a confession to make." But right. well, we don't know if he makes that confession because, well, no, he says he says I walk off the stage and I don't say anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, but 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 the movie plays with the conventions of like a narrative film where he's talking to a film producer and they go through like three different. It was like Wayne's World. Yeah. <laughs> they're going like three different endings here. Right. 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 And, right. Yeah. And, and each of them are, are are pretty hilarious and satisfying. I thought the romantic comedy one in the in the middle where he like reconnects with the girl. He's like, I haven't been myself. Right. Like, I, right, I was right. like, yeah, that is corny. I agree. <laughs> with the director there. Right, right. Him getting smoked in the end was, you know, like too silly, but I mean that that's as black as you can get right. with just like stereotypical like bullshit yeah. kind of like black movie, but I I loved sort of how Thelonious is sick of woke culture. Yeah. Like he has that beginning of the movie where he's holding a class 
and he has the N word on the board, and like some white girl in his class is saying, "I I don't feel comfortable with that word." And he's like, "Well, I'm black. I'm comfortable with it." Right. <laughs> What's the problem here? Right. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like I, honestly, I think the screenplay is really smart, and yeah. I, and I think like Cord Jefferson, you know, for it being his first film, it's very well done. Oh yeah. I, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm with you. I think like I'm with you on like the the family stuff, sort of making it a little bit longer than it had to be, being a little bit maybe maybe two again as i said two separate movies going on at the same time yeah but but i also think i kind of give that that stuff a pass as well because i think it kind of grounds it in a way where yeah. you're seeing these characters in their sort of real state of mind in their yeah. real you know who they actually are the life that they're actually leading while he's trying to sort of pretend to be something else yeah. that he's not um and i think honestly what won, won me over about it at, like makes me forget about some of its flaws as you said yeah. is that the acting from uh Sterling K Brown yeah. and from Jeffrey Wright is like all oh, so good yeah. it's just all so top notch acting that i'm just like man like if if they didn't have such great actors in this it would've been a totally different movie it wouldn't have yeah. never worked and um oh excuse me yeah uh, so yeah, so I was I was quite a fan of it at the end, and I think uh, it's kind of it, it's interesting. I only saw it once. It's a type yeah. of movie that I definitely want to see again to maybe see how mm -hmm. I'd feel about the second time around. It's a film yeah. that makes me think of like the dynamics, of course, not just with the, with with uh, Jeffrey Wright's performance, but also with with the guy who plays his brother, played by Sterling K. Brown. Because like one is the one who has the most success and can help with the many difficult means of that life then he has the other side which is that sibling who should be of help but yeah not instead no he's kind of a fuck first. up so, you know? right. yeah, yeah. so it kind of is almost like where i kind of like american fiction it's almost like with like you know his it's like it's like it's like success is halted by by the fact of like of, of, of like of like everything falls on him because of how he's the one who could probably afford the means right. to help out and everyone just like 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 resorts to him doing that but at the same time he wants something that he wants to be like his success like he wishes people would would listen to him in his craft or market his craft right. he wishes yeah that he'd have contracts that he wants again instead of forcing to get it kind of really proves or displays how it might be in today's society for the life of an author because a lot of times an author is told well this won't sell yeah right yeah. I, I think that that is what it sort of speaks to the most too in terms of like the family stuff it talks about like the intellect of the general public today of how like the you know they'll eat up something that's stereotypical but yeah. when when you write something or, or you have a movie that is intellectual or something that will be refreshing people will call it boring yeah. or people will call it oh i i just didn't get it or you know i think it sort of speaks to that sort of anti-intellectual oh. culture that we kind of live uh, in nowadays yeah yeah everything oh. needs to be dumbed down and yeah i mean that's why he has that ending with a movie director where he gets <laughs> right. smoked in the end because it's like that's what people are going to gravitate towards yeah. right it reminds me a little bit of the player yeah. when they have like the the very end of the film and you know they they go with an intellectual direction but then they decide no have bruce willis come in and just shoot the place <laughs> right, up, <you> know? <laughs> right it's like yeah it's kind yeah. of like you know the the low-hanging fruit right yeah you know pushing back against those who say oh superhero movies are cinema and i can't sit that long for killers of the flower moon when it's yeah. like well you know maybe educate yourself it's and like try well you did just different. sit for three hours to just see another superhero <laughs> exactly. movie you know like so, avengers is like nearly three yeah, hours yeah right so it's like i i think the movies like american fiction are are awesome the way that um, you know they speak to how we as a collective society have somehow found being smart to be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, oh, that's American culture for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't wait for this and, election. And, and, right. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even then, like, even like, and, and I'll tell you, because I even know book authors like, like today and some are still 
doing that stuff. And then they tell me they've had times where it's like, where it's like they fire their agent or something because how their agent won't really push for what they're wanting. And it's yeah. almost like in this case with American fiction only, he's not really in that case where he feels he can do that. It's so much where it's like, I have to accept this even though I hate it because I got all this other dynamic stuff. So it's like, it's like he has to let the success he does not want come over him so he can help if so much else is falling onto him. Right. And he hates that. Yeah, which yeah. is what makes this entertaining in such a way. For sure. Yeah, for well, sure. Well, the comedy works great. <laughs> yeah, the comedy is the great. <laughs> like the fact that because this guy has to pretend to be this whole other person. And yeah. You know, there's a scene where he's mo- meeting with the movie director and they're inside the restaurant <laughs> and he's worried about his mother and he sees the ambulance go by and he runs off. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you've been in prison. Uh, no, no, you killed someone. It's like, I used to that, not me. You know? <laughs> yeah. like, like, all that stuff's great. Yeah. But yeah, and, and I think Jeffrey Rush's character, like he, uh, Jeffrey Wright's character, he didn't uh, believe in race, but yet he had to write this novel. Right. And yes. there's that great scene where he encounters the girl who kind of wrote the stereotypical black novel. Right. And he's just like, you're, well, you're just feeding off the profits of white people wanting atonement. Right. You know, and that, right. that was a that, that was a great moment just speaking to what people levitate towards in terms for, of literature. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really great conversation starter of a movie and... Um, yeah, I, I hope we get more movies like it going forward. It's really smart. And, it's and just I, beautiful. And I feel like, you know, that's the thing. I feel like the newer trends of directors, like even as this Cord Jefferson's first movie, I feel like like the newer directors have like a better form of originality totally. for many purposes because like, this is my first feature. I want to see what I can do. And sometimes they're given limitations or whatever right. limitations they can use. They want to they wanna do that to the right context. So that's why I think... I think the limits of what a new director has sometimes is where is where something real and a little more like mesmerizing or memorable or or different is what comes into play for new directors. Right. I feel like new directors have a bigger chance of more originality in their newer features. They do. To- totally. Yeah. That, that's a good thing to speak to about all <laughs> 10 of these Best Picture nominees, yes. even though like there's probably no such thing anymore as originality. <laughs> yeah. All of these movies, whether it's Poor Things, is like is piggybacking <laughs> off of, of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein yeah, or, yeah. Or, or Barbie is piggybacking off of corporate, you know, <laughs> you know, like toys. Um, all of them still have their own sort of original strokes that yeah. make them feel like very unique and it's the right direction I feel like where cinema needs to be going. Yeah, yeah. they're not going in like a very predictable yeah. predictable place. I mean even the Oppenheimer. Yeah. It's not a predictable movie. Right. You know, like I said before, you could have made a movie where Oppenheimer just goes around and he's like, I shouldn't have dropped the bomb, I feel bad. <laughs> right. It, you don't do that. It was more about a guy who is in a position where he was forced, not forced, but he, you know, but basically he was in a race against the Nazis to make a bomb. Yeah. Up until he decided to just drop it on Japan anyways. Right. You know, which um, introduces like a whole litany of moral questions. Totally. You know, but, 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 but it was a movie that wasn't predictable and where it would go. And you, you, yeah. you, you would try to see what would happen next. Cause I think if anyone else directed that movie, it just would have been Oppenheimer smoking his last days away and yeah you know, and i think speaking. for us I, I think for us as critics like we're not like anti superhero movies but it was really yeah. refreshing to see a shift of like original action films original sort of biopics original stories storytelling getting the attention it deserves and going forward i mean when we look at the slate for 2024 it looks like studios are saying yes to more projects taking more risks and the superhero movies are really kind of like taking a back seat and i know it's early but it's like you know you see some of the movies that came out of sundance that's exciting you know you got movies yeah. like long legs coming up you got movies like um, a real pain like, yeah exactly I'm, yeah I, I am anxious to find out when that one totally makes it out. so i mean there, there's a lot of um what's the christian stewart kill um, um what's it called you would know this the christian stewart movie that's coming out oh uh, uh, it'll come to me uh, Love Lies Bleeding. But, uh, Love yeah. Lies Bleeding. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Love like, Lies Bleeding. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cool new movies coming out, and I think, um, yeah, it's something to be excited for at least. And even you know, like with studios, like I even feel studios, like like the ones like we didn't know about years ago, now they're here, like. Neon A24, they're doing, like, so many good stuff frequently now. Yeah. Like, stuff you don't even think about when you watch, like, wow, that's actually pretty cool of a yeah. movie. <laughs> totally. Yeah. 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 yeah but, and that's the thing, because our slate, I, I think because now that 
the whole Avengers Endgame thing happened. Right. And everyone popped their multiverse cherry with Spider Man. Right. Like it's 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 like there's a burnout with yeah. it. You yeah. You know, we, we we we've had our cake, we've eaten it, and now we don't want much more <laughs> of it because it's not that we're sick of superhero movies. We're just sick of seeing the same superhero Thank movies. Thank you. And yes. th- and when you say the same, like I even think back to old franchise of superhero movies like sometimes you look at the x-men franchise i'm like they lost track of the timeline like five or six movies ago right. and they haven't really picked up from anywhere right in a yeah. way. that's right. the direction many superhero trends are falling into i yeah. feel yeah yeah Just yeah, yeah well well i mean the, like the newest or the most original kind of recent superhero film was the batman i love that. and yeah and and that one not a lot of audiences really gravitated towards in a yeah. way no. yeah yeah because and it'll be yeah, it'll be interesting, you know, what uh, they're able to do with that series, and maybe that can be a little bit of a, of a revival. But um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what happens going forward. And I do think it's it is exciting. We're going to see more original sci-fi, original yeah. uh, action movies, original dramas, and and hopefully that's keeps keeps a trend that keeps going. Yeah. Yeah, because I, 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 and this has been a great year for movies because the superhero stuff has died down. Yeah. And we're gravitating towards more original, I don't want to say IPs, but yeah. films, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, there's a reason Oppenheimer made so much money at the box office. Yeah. You know, we get, well, Christopher <laughs> right. Nolan's a marketable name. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I remember I was a Christopher Nolan fan before Batman. Right. It was. I remember I saw Memento on yeah. TV. That's an amazing yeah. movie. And I just remember, yeah. I was like, what, what is this movie? Who <laughs> yeah. is this guy? Yeah. And then I got the, I rented the DVD. Right. And then they had the preview for following. And I'm like, what's that movie? <laughs> yeah. I saw that. And then I saw Insomnia years before that already. Yeah. And yeah. that introduced me to like this whole other voice in cinema. Yeah. And I think we are gravitating towards more directors who want to find the subtlety in their work yeah. rather than just the dramatics. Okay. And th- th- that's the nice thing about this year's Best Picture nominees is that they don't go for the easy, dramatic sort of moment. They, right. they go for the, the moments that make you think a little more and, yeah. and, 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 and reflect on what you just saw and make you feel feel in a way that's beyond words and right that that's why i mean we're in a more promising direction i think films go categories go through fads yeah you know we went through that with the musical we went through that with the western yeah and with the superhero thing i think we're finally getting over that i mean we still have joker coming out but that's like a different type of property it's making right. fun of it it's making like a musical a lot of it yep yep yeah yeah and we're getting i mean all the newest things are coming from the batman universe yeah which is yeah <laughs> but we're, we're getting new things from new directors that isn't just the same old bullshit like right. we're actually <laughs> getting movies with subtext and context that you can Rewatch a bunch of times and get different meanings. And now, yeah. now when we were on, when you mentioned um, um, Memento, one thing you remind me of, um, looking back at Christopher Nolan, I've realized, like up until Oppenheimer, because Oppenheimer was radar. I'm like, wow, the last R-rated movie Nolan did was Memento. So I'm oh, like, wow. wow, he wanted his audience to be wider with his Batman franchise and in Inception, but now he went a little more uh, route where his films hit the R rating mark. Yeah, again, kind yeah. of thing. Definitely. Yeah, so I mean, it's a really good group. Uh, you know, overall, it'll be interesting to see. You know, I don't know if there's going to be any upsets on Oscar night, but um, hopefully, no one gets slapped. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Hopefully, someone does get slapped. That'll be, <laughs> oh, that'll, that'll be, be more entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I I just wonder if they'll do jokes for that because they did that the year previous, the year after that one. Yeah, so no one will get slapped this year. We may. We, yeah, we like no Jimmy one. Kimmel had like his little. <laughs> list on there he's saying okay no incidents today yeah but (laughs) i I don't know that's why they got jimmy it's funny how jimmy kimmel is now the voice of like woke culture (laughs) when before he was the guy who hosted the man show and they had women jumping on trampolines yeah and now all of a sudden he's like no no he's mr woke now (laughs) (laughs) he's he's a safe choice to go to when you want to host the show no chris rock no uh 
No well, Kevin so, Hart. Yeah, no. Ke- Kevin Hart's like the same. Didn't they? Yeah, they fired Kevin Hart. They did. It was, and he's like the safest choice I could imagine. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was so yeah. stupid. It was some social media thing. But then I guess they say the problem is they actually look thoroughly deep into the background. Yeah, stuff, I mean, he, so, he, he said like, some no. ridiculous. Yeah, he, he said some awful things. But um, but uh, he's a comedian. They <laughs> right. That, that's their that's their forte. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Jimmy Kimmel, he fits the bill for them, yeah. and that's that's fine. I mean, you know, yeah. again, for for me as a critic, I literally could care less about like who's hosting and all I agree. that stuff. I'm, I love usually... I love the results more. Exactly. Yeah. I I miss the old days. I miss Billy, Billy Crystal, Crystal days. Yes. Yeah. Billy yes. Crystal. Yes. <laughs> like those, like I, one of my friends got nominated for an Oscar way back. It was for a short documentary, so nobody cares. Uh, but he got nominated for a short documentary, and that was the year like Billy Crystal. That was the year. Um, Silence of the Lambs won Best Picture, mm-hmm. and they wheeled Billy Crystal out in right. the uh, in the Hannibal on the Lecter. gurney, yep. yeah, a gurney, and he yep. had the he had the mask on. And that was the same year that Jack Palance did one arm push ups. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll but, see. Yeah, maybe they'll try to get back to that. Yeah, stuff. but I mean, we also we watch the Oscars because we love the crazy moments. <laughs> of sure. It, you know? like, yeah. I mean, God, if, if I were to think of my favorite craziest moments, I'd say, okay, well, La La Land is my favorite. Yeah. I mean, when they got the yeah. wrong nominee. Oh, God. That and was then, just, you're just like, how do I feel right now? Oh, like, that I was crazy. Know. I was yeah. feeling great. I'm like, yeah. this is fucking entertainment. Yeah, that was you wild. Know? Yeah, they, they had that. They had, uh, well, who won for A Beautiful Life or something like that? It was an Italian guy, and he. Oh, Roberto cl- Benigni. Roberto Benigni yeah. was climbing up on the chairs. Yep. Oh, my God. Yes. You know, the, 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 like, you watch the Oscars for that. You yeah. watch and- it. Because you kind of want to see a train wreck happen or a memorable uh, moment. Right. Funny thing is that same year when the slap happened to Chris Rock from Will Smith, I remember I already had my ticket to see Chris Rock, and I saw Chris Rock live a few months after, and I knew he was going to talk about that because that slap literally made his ticket sales skyrocket. And the words he said at that show is, if someone tells you words hurt, they don't know what it feels like to be smacked in the face. Right. <laughs> yeah, by Muhammad Ali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, and he's like, Will Smith, I was going to suffer. I went to work the next day. My social media skyrocketed. I was doing good for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that the result of the Oscars, man, th- yeah. it's amazing. Well, Will happens. Smith isn't uh, reinvited, but he no. already has his Oscar. Couple more, couple more years until they let him back wow. in. <laughs> yeah, got about two more years. More. That's nothing. No, eight, eight I, or seven. Uh, I, think. Okay. I think it was a ten-year <laughs> probation. Yeah, even so, he'll be back. It'll be. It's he already has deal. some stuff coming up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, but yeah, this Oscar season, I think we're excited for it. I think. Yeah. Uh, I think we're all rooting for the big winner. Oppenheimer. Yeah. Yes. I know. If it doesn't win, I'll kind of uh, I'll be I surprised. I will scream at the TV. <laughs> uh, I, I do that enough. With it. It's funny. Um, with the Oscars, I act like it's a Super Bowl. Like, yeah. I, yeah I, it's like, uh, I, mean, I, I don't want to say what well, one of my friends <laughs> repeated, but like he called it the gay Super Bowl. Oh, jeez. Yeah, well, he's a gay oh. guy, so he said oh. it. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's our, it's, our, it's film critics, Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, you know, the series, the, the, uh, season is always way too long. So by the time we finally get to it, you're like, all right, I'm glad it's over, but hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll see some surprises this year. I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hopefully so. But thank you guys for doing this. If you want to check out Tarek from Yumi, bleh, if you want to check out Tarek from Yumi, you can go to movies Tarek.com. If you want to check out Leo Brady stuff, go to a movie guy.com he has a lot of great interviews yeah you just interviewed ian mcshane so i'm excited to see that yeah take a look yeah and yeah. And, and plenty of more stuff coming up on the year you know where we're now it's starting to get into the good stuff like you know after get after january it's you know all those bad movies are over with and uh plenty of stuff on the movie yeah. guy.com so yeah. yeah check it out yeah there. the good stuff comes what like around march or show, uh, yeah. show january is very hit or miss yes <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah january is just set up it's i'll a, go to the screening now i'll pass quite a few times <laughs> yeah yeah it's a, it's a lot of those movies i don't know how to feel about lisa frankenstein but yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but guys thank you so much for coming thank on you. if you liked what you saw Go to ypareviews.com. The YPA stands for You'll Probably Agree. You can also uh, subscribe on YouTube and TikTok and all that at YPA Reviews. I think on TikTok it's actually YPA Reviews 2001 because 2001 is Space Odyssey is my favorite movie. Oh, awesome. Right. Classic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Awesome, Mike. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye.